sea, abyssal, and hadal zone, and talk also about co shelf and even coastal science. And there are more reasons for me to do that today, even in this context. And that is, I think there's a lot of things we learn from these environments that we need to take with us into the deep sea when we start trying to interpret what we are seeing. It's also because many of the technologies we apply at relatively shallow waters today, I think, have a great potential to learn us more about the deep sea and, um, and the Hadal environment. Good. So, bendic oxygen dynamics, a challenge in resolving spatial and uh, uh, temporal scales. So the first relevant question, of course, since the title is, well, why do so many people spend a significant proportion of their professional life and a significant proportion of their private life to study oxygen dynamics in sediments? And there are many good reasons for that. One is, of course, that oxygen is very important for any higher organisms. It's also very important in regulating uh, many biogeochemical processes and mobility of various materials, and it's intimately linked to the carbon cycle. As you all know here, CO2 is fixed by photosynthesis, releasing oxygen, and when a similar amount of material is released, or when, when it's uh, released, a similar amount of CO2 is um, released and oxygen is taken up during that process. If that was the only thing that happened, oxygen and CO2 concentration would be constant. That would be in an aquarium and that would be on, on the globe as such. But uh, one of the prime reasons regulating for why we have fluctuations in CO2 and oxygen is actually the efficiency by which carbon is buried, especially in marine sediments. A significant fraction of the organic material produced in the photic zone ultimately making it to the seabed where it's turned over. So it's turned over, releasing nutrients and CO2 back to ensure continued production in the water column. But another important fraction is retained in the sediment record. And that's exactly what is regulating the CO2 and the oxygen availability on the planet on larger time scales. So the sediment is an important sink for carbon and nutrients on long time scale, but it's also an important site for resupplying these materials for building blocks of other uh, biology. Um, and then I'll just take you a little bit into bendic primary reduction towards the very end. I think one of the things that we have forgotten is that bendic primary reduction actually is a significant part of the carbon cycle on larger scales. And uh, I'll, I'll take you to that to the very end. Okay, so what is happening when organic material is reaching the seabed? We have a relatively well understood of how the carbon is degraded, the different processes that are integrated, and I won't go through that here. The point I want to make is that instead, we can of course measure all these process rates, and that's very important. We get an insight of which process rates are important for degrading the carbon and why it's regulated as it is. But if we want just a proxy for the total turnover of carbon, we can measure the oxygen uptake rate. And the reason is that oxygen is partly consumed for normal aerobic heterotrophic activity here, and another part is used to reoxidize reduced equivalent coming from the anaerobic degradation as sulfate reduction, for instance, the sulfide diffusing up, reoxidized with an equivalent amount of oxygen. And therefore, even though a significant proportion of the carbon is turned over anaerobically, the total uptake of oxygen gives a good proxy for how much carbon is turned over in the seabed. That is an important point. I often see, even in literature nowadays, the misinterpretation of oxygen dynamics because re not remembering that oxygen is actually used for two groups of processes in the sediment that have very different kinetics, and dynamics. We'll see that in some disguises in the examples I'll show today. Okay, so oxygen um, is used for aerobic respiration and for reoxidation processes, and therefore can be used as a proxy for the total turnover of carbon. We do make some assumption. We ignore denitrification. We ignore some burial of pyrite, but generally they can balance each other out. We can also measure them if we want to correct for that. But overall, that is the case. So how do we measure the oxygen uptake rate of the seabed? There are several ways, but the two classical ways, and we'll talk about some new developments within this and new techniques later on today. But the classical approach is simply just to enclose your core and then measure the rate by which oxygen is declining in there, and then you get the total oxygen uptake. You can also, from micro profiles, measure the oxygen profile through the water sediment interface, and from the distribution of this calculate how much oxygen is consumed here. You can use fixed first law of diffusion, take the gradient in the diffusive boundary layer, 
and thereby calculate how much diffusive uptake does the sediment have. You can also, from the curvature of the concentration profiles in the sediment, say, well, where is this oxygen consumed? What is the volume-specific activity? And we'll come back to that, why that can be relevant a little later. When you do both, you have the total oxygen uptake rate, which equal the diffusive oxygen uptake rate, and any other processes, mainly fauna activity. Now, this is done on recovered sediment cores. The other approach is to use bendic landers, as Doc just talked about before. Instead of taking the sediments up, sending down the instruments, and measure directly on the seabed, with the guess, or because we think that sediment cores recovered are affected by the recovery process, and thereby changes the microbial communities and the metabolic activity of the cores. And in fact, that is what uh, has been shown, and what is happening is that here you have one example where we have measured oxygen profiles in the laboratory and in situ, and we've done hundreds and thousands of profiles like this, where you see the very reproducible result here that in the laboratory, oxygen extends much shallower into the sediment than it does in situ, indicating a much higher dynamic activity in the sediment where you recover it. We interpret this as a release of a lyse, uh, or bacteria or also myofauna potentially lysing, releasing DOC to the pore water, stimulating the survivors to have a feast on what's left over and thereby have a very high, high um, activity. And of course, the processes inducing this lysis is most likely temperature he uh, heating, which is very difficult to avoid when you recover sediment, but also the pressure release. If you plot the ratio between what you measure in the laboratory and in situ versus water depth here for the oxygen consumption, you can see it's gradually increasing. The bias is increasing the deeper we go. When we go out to five kilometers of depth, we measure 3.5 times higher metabolic activity in the sediment than we do um, in situ. When you get about one kilometer, the effect is not significantly different. And the oxygen penetration depth at five kilometers of depth is only 20% when we measure it in the laboratory compared to what it is in the situ. A strong indication that if we want to have reliable metabolic activity measurements or turnover rates or dynamic process rates, we need to measure things in situ when we go deep. Here I have compiled the high quality data that exists measured in situ on oxygen uptake rates all over the world. At least that was in, in 2008 when I, I did this. Um, and yeah, the best single parameter that fits the data, meaning the oxygen uptake rate, is the water depth. And you can get a relation like this. This closed symbols is the total oxygen uptake rate, so measured with an enclosure. The diffusive oxygen uptake rate measured by uh, microprofiles. The difference here is the contribution from the fauna. If you integrate that up, generally on the bathometry we have in the oceans, globally speaking, about 20% of the oxygen uptake rates on the seabed is driven by my, uh, fauna, the rest by microbes. If we multiply this simple relations here for the oxygen uptake rate to the bathometry of the global ocean, we get a number for how much carbon is turned over in the seabed generally, and that equips to about 3% of the global primary production. Um, but one, I mean, it, it sounds like a big number, but astonishing to me at least is that it's only equivalent to about 50% of the global anthropogenic increase of CO2 in the atmosphere now. The entire integrated CO2 release from the seabed is only 50% of how much the speed by which CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere currently. We can plot the oxygen uptake rate or the CO2 uh, oxidation rate versus the water depth in a cumulative fashion. And we can see, well, which part of the oceans are responsible for this turnover. And it's roughly, when we take one kilometer, roughly 50% is turned over at water depth shallower than one kilometer, and roughly 1%, uh, 50% at deeper depth. So even though we have very low activity in the deep sea, because of the vast extents of the deep sea, it contributes significantly to the global turnover of carbon uh, in the ocean. You can see it also here in areas the, even though we have very low activities at what we can define as deep sea, there are many definitions of that, but over 2,000 meters here, uh, it contributes by about 44% of the global turnover of carbon because it covers 87% of the global ocean. That equivalents to about 2.3% of 
of the primary production uh, in that compartment. Now, there have been a lot of measurements. This is a slightly updated one, about 450 measurements in two, 2010. But still, you can sort of see they're very unevenly distributed. There are areas where we don't know very much. I mean, the Indian Oceans, the Southern Ocean uh, are practically unexplored for uh, dynogenetic processing. Um, and if you take the average, it corresponds to that we have one measurement per an area the size of France. And from that, we're trying to build a global budget clearly showing that we need more measurements around. Not that it's interesting just to map grid-wise, but targeted um, measurements in areas that we think has a potential importance for the global budget. Now, you see there's a lot of scatter in this. This is lock lock plots. And that's not because the data is not of a high quality. That's because there's more to the story than single wa simple water depth regulating how much carbon is turned over in the seabed. And one of the very important factors is the primary production. What you have here is from remote sensing, quantifying how much the primary production is using an uh, algorithm of Velkovsky. And you have the stations we have visited here. You can see the red is the very uh, high productive areas and blue and green less productive. If you plot our data, we clearly see that they cluster. So we have data, for instance, from upwelling regions or for high productive zones, which have one attenuation with depth here. And we have for more oligotrophic regions here and uh, areas here showing another attenuation with depth. The reason, of course, because less carbon is coming down, the less productivity you have in the zone, uh, in the photic zone. And therefore, we can improve the simplified approach we used before by just having the carbon turnover as a function of primary production and um, water depth. And having that, and having that from remote sensing and bathro the bathrometric maps, we can actually generate. Well, what I should say here is actually this slightly more uh, complex way. Uh, oh, there's something missing that's falling out here. But trust me, if you use this uh, way of quantifying, you actually get more or less the same overall integrated number as you do when you do the global mapping. You just get a better statistics on it because you account for the differences in productivity for different regions. But from that, you can then create maps of how much carbon is turned on the seabed. You can generate maps of the oxygen penetration depth, and you can quantify how much carbon is turned over by fauna. And by this different approach, we get to a pretty similar number than the 20%, 21%, about 34 million tons in the Atlantic Ocean, for instance. We are currently working on trying to, to make global maps on this using the databases that we have and global algorithm for primary production. That's, that's work we are, are still in progress of doing to see uh, where we can expect intensified activities uh, in the ocean. Now, that's one reason for why we have this scatter here. It's not accounting for the variability in the productivity zone. Other reason is that the seabed is not flat. It's a very varied landscape that can allow horizontal transport of material that actually do measure the seabed. One ex famous example is from some of the work of Rick Janke and Claire Reimer, some of the pioneers in this area, showed how carbon is transported from co continental shelf downslope to the deep sea. There's also reason for why you have, when you have mountains and other topographic features on the seabed that can change the upwelling of nutrients to the surface zone and induce higher productivity locally, which has an impact on the sediment. But one extreme feature uh, is the deep hadal trenches. And that with the expectation that potentially it could be that we had intensified activity in deep trenches, we conducted three cruises to deep trenches, um, the Mariana Trench, the Zubinin Trench, and the Tonga Trench to see to what extent the uh, uh, turnover of organic material or the deposition of material there was intensified compared to the normal abyssal plane. I don't know why this it works a little different than it does in my back home. Okay, um, but the idea is that when you have these deep trenches, you have a funneling of a gamma material reaching deep into the sediment, um, which could lead to a higher deposition and turnover of carbon. And we used bendiglanders to go down to the bottom of the trench. And indeed, what we saw was here profiles measured at almost at the bottom of uh, the deepest point in, in the Mariana Trench, and here an abyssal plain site, which is about 50 kilometers to the south of this site. 
more or less, if you look 1D receiving, uh, uh, if you look at those in a one-dimensional, having the same productivity in the overlying water column. You see a faster attenuation of oxygen here, showing that it is consumed fast, and you can calculate that in the deep trench, it's actually consumed twice as fast as it is in the shallower side. So strongly confirming that, in fact, when you go really deep, when you go into the trenches, you have hotspots for turnover of organic material, a hotspot for deposition, and a hotspot for turnover. It was not just the integrated microbial activity that was in, uh, elevated, it's also actually the organic content of the sediment, phytopigments as proxies for uh, phycodetritus, the abundances of bacteria, and the excess lead to 10, which is a proxy for how many particles are coming down, was all higher in the trends as compared to the abyssal plain. So, uh, yeah. In the Tonga trench, this is work that still in, is in progress, we saw the same. Here you see the oxygen profile measured in situ at almost 10 kilometers of depth in the Tonga trench, and here at the abyssal plain, very nearby. Again, an intensified activity in the trench compared to the abyssal plain. And also, as we've just seen Doc showing too, there was teeming with amphipods there, and I think we actually caught the biggest amphipod ever caught on one of our bendic landers. We put traps on there to see not to be quantify, or not to quantify them in any way, but just to see if there were life and how many there were. And there were a huge abundance of amphipods, and we caught this one, and that was the only one survive on that trap because quickly they eat each other when they get entrapped um, uh, there. And here, uh, from the Isu Benin of Japan, a little south of Japan, uh, unfortunately, uh, a typhoon came up and cut the crew short, so we didn't get measurements on the abyssal plain here, but Extraordinary, the oxygen penetration depth at this water depth, 9.2 kilometers of depth, um, is only six centimeters, showing a very high intensified activity within the Japan Trench. And true, the trenches work as hotspots both for the deposition, retention, and turnover of organic material. One of the, the basically what we've briefly talked about two, two basically processes that are supplying the material uh, to the trench. And one is sudden slides of organic material that lands into the sediment. And we had the fortunate uh, opportunity to use a very unfortunate situation, which was the big earthquakes in Japan in 2011 to visit the Japan Trench four months later. And we could see here are some sediment cores and some scanning imaging here where you can see that there had been deposited 30 centimeters of sediment in the central trench. You can see that on the lead to 10 here, which shows the normal exponential decline here. And you also see the cesium here going much, much deeper, which normally only goes to about six, eight centimeters normal deep sea uh, sediments. That's an integrated measure from, weight, from radionuclide uh, test back in the 50s that was evenly distributed here, showing that you have a landslide of a vast deposition of organic material into the trench. Um, close by to what we also saw was that we found cesium-134, which only have a half-life time of two, about two years. And the only place where this could come from was the Fukushima nuclear power plant. So four months after the disaster, we could find cesium from the uh, Fuji, uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant in the bottom of the Hadal trenches, showing something about the connectivity between the trenches and the, around, the surrounding areas. The reason why we think this could happen so fast was that at the same time there was a bloom in the waters off of Skeletonema. So we found high densities of Fugodetritus even very deep down in the trenches. And we think that the cesium was uh, connected to this Fugodetritus and quickly carried into the trenches, showing something that maybe it's not as static in the trenches as we believe. Another thing that was very interesting from the video toes along the trenches was that you could see tremendous amount of carcasses of dead animals that's, of course, sliding down uh, along with the, this mud slide into the trench, being buried into the sediment and creating hotspots within the sediment that can sustain anaerobic activity. So potentially, depending on the oxygen penetration depth, uh, aerobic activity for a long time and really induce microbial hotspots within the sediment. Uh, this work was all of our Hadal work, and that pr was mainly done on Schloss funding. We had site projects and so on, and that made us uh, to apply for a, a much bigger grant, which we were fortunate to get rewarded, and Hades ERC, which is a five-year project where we're going to 
focus work in Japan trends, climatic trends, and Atacama trends over the next five years using novel landed technologies where we're going to measure both the aerobic but also anaerobic degradation processes like denitrification and sulfate reduction rates, uh, targeting these three trenches because they reflect a very nice variability in productivity. So we have a relatively oligotrophic here, a mesotrophic here, and a very high uh, eutrophic Atacama trench uh, here. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm here, to, uh, uh, apart from the ecodeme, is also to explore and, and discuss uh, possibilities for collaboration, especially with Osvaldo, uh, with the Hegel activities here to, to join forces on some of these things. Good. Okay, that was a bit of the seascape. So seascapes create a variability in the deposition of organic material, which can induce extreme hotspots like, for instance, trenches. But if you zoom in on the sediment, it's also a landscape. We know that there's a small scale heterogeneity at the sediment surface. So one question is, how many profiles do you need to measure the average? Or how variable is the oxygen uptake rate of the metabolic activity on the smaller scale? And to address that question, we made a transecting lander. So the lander goes down and then it can move its centers along horizontally with the sediment and measure many, many profiles. And from that, we can map the distribution of oxygen across the sediment water interface. In this case, for instance, 130 profiles, almost about 100, about 200 uh, square centimeter. And you can see just from single pick profiles here, the enormous variability in the oxygen penetration depth. If we plot it differently, what I have here is the oxygen, is the surface of the sediment, which is the white line. You have about 20 centimeters here, and you have about three centimeters here. These are then consecutive profiles plotted like this. And you can see the enormous variability on oxygen availability within the sediment. Now, if we take the second derivative, as I said, before using the second law of diffusion, we can calculate where this oxygen is actually consumed. And you get a mosaic like this within below the sediment surface. Oxygen is reused very heterogeneously in these patches around. You may have a hotspot. It's difficult for me to see the screen here. But you could have a hotspot here. You can have another hotspot here where completely different processes are occurring and completely different organisms are thriving. And I think that's a very important reminder here. If you want to relate processes, or even if you want to relate coexistence of organisms, this is the sampling scale we have to look at. Things are happening here, not here. And that's very important when you align uh, substrate. There's another example um, uh, from a similar uh, study here. If, if we extend it, oh, sorry. If we extend it a little bit, what we have done is we have placed our instruments in patterns on the bed at 1,500 meters of water, roughly, and where we have measured hundreds and hundreds of micro profiles. And this is just the ox each dot here is the oxygen penetration depth. And this is the average, about 3.9 as far as, yeah, 3.9, along a transect of 150 meters. And you can already hear, see, the variability is happening on the small scale. You can see a tremendous variations in the oxygen penetration depth, reflecting the metabolic turnover. And having all these data, we can calculate statistically, well, how far should I move on average before I have a significant difference in my metabolic activity? And the average number in this case come about by 2.1 centimeter. And that's roughly what we find in different settings. So there's a structure in the seabed about giving a patchiness in the order of two centimeters, one to two centimeters. And I won't have time to go into that. We have actually done quite some work, too, investigating the importance of viruses and virus importance regulating microbial activity and diversity in sediments. But what I just want to point out here is the variability we found in viruses and virus abundance. And the ratio between bacteria and virus was tremendous. It covered the entire global database just in these 170 meters, reflecting that things are variable on the small scale not the big scale. It doesn't matter to move a meter, two meter, 10 meters, or 50 meters, of course, until you get onto seascapes. Um, it matters to move a small distance. That's an important take home measure, I think. Now to study that a little more in detail, I wanna show you another technique we have developed, which is called planar outroad. It, I think it's becoming more and more uh, generally applicable now. I won't go into too much detail with it, but the idea is that you have a fluorescent dye, uh, which the fluorescent signal from that dye reflects how much oxygen is available. You can use that for point centers, which are commercially available nowadays. You can also immobilize them on a foil 
And then you can put them in front of a camera and you can take images of the oxygen distribution or you can take movies of the oxygen distribution. You can also mount that on a periscope and insert the periscope into the sediment and take images and movies of the oxygen dynamic. Now, one such example of that here is, these are just static images here, but that's a skeletonema aggregates that's settling as an aggregate to the sediment surface. You can see how it's within 170 hours. I can't see the numbers here. I think it's about 170 hours here. Small red down there. You can see an anoxic micronesis is occurring and it's vanishing out again as this hotspot is disintegrating. So food to the deep sea is coming in parcels of organic material, inducing a hotspot where things are turned over on a relatively short time scale. And I have here a movie showing um, these phenomena here. This is a four days movie with an interval of about 10 minutes. You can see an aggregate settle here, and you can see an anoxic micronesis is, is involving here. You can see how all the myofauna is homing in on this hotspot, taking advantage of this source of food that's coming there. You can see that once some myofauna had made the, the channel, other myofauna dig in and use that pathway, also because, suspectedly, that uh, molecules are moving along this um, path so that the myofauna can sense it and home in on the aggregates. And after a period of the order of four to six days, that's gone, it's exploited and used. So it's extremely dynamic with these hotspots coming down, being colonized, and then turn over. Here, something went wrong with the gas mix, so that's what's happening there. <laughs> that's, um, so aggregates are important in regulating the activity on the seabed and turning over and structuring the microscale patchiness in activity and diversity. Now, to look a little more in detail of what is happening to aggregate, we've done some other work where we form aggregates in the laboratory to find out what is happening when they're sinking. Here they're made of skeletonema. And to try to understand to what extent they affect in the deeper ocean or deep sea um, turnover of nitrogen, we kept the oxygen concentrations constant at different levels, as you can see here, while incubating the aggregates. And what you saw was that nitrate was consumed by these aggregates at quite significant concentrations or quite fast. When we measured oxygen profile through the aggregate as they were sinking, you can do that by putting them in a special jet stream and then measure profiles through them. We could see they were oxygen depleted in the center. And when you get down to oxygen levels about 15% here, they'd actually get oxygen. The threshold was actually 40% here where we saw the first aggregates with anoxia. So what happened to that nitrate that was taken up? By using various combination and N15 labeled incubation techniques, we could quantify where the nitrate went. And that was clearly a function of the ambient oxygen concentrations. If you had lower concentrations, you had the reduced substances, as you can see here. Nitrite turned out to be a very important molecule, which is very important, as that is one key component for anamox in OM sets, for instance. And nitrite is produced in very high numbers in these aggregates. But another important finding was that the skeletonema aggregate, uh, the skeletonema cells here, was able to store intercellular very high concentration of nitrate. And that, at the high oxygen concentration, was the most important uh, fate of the nitrate. So it remains within the cell that could concentrate up to about 10,000 times ambient fold. So it's integrated in the aggregates. And if it's not turned over, it's getting down, exported out of the photic zone into the deep sea at very high concentrations. So that allows us to make sort of a, just a conceptual uh, diagram here, where the aggregates consist of an oxic outer shell and an anoxic core where you can have anoxic processes going on here and the oxic processes going on here. I won't go in detail with it, but which overall has a very important implications for the nitrogen turnover and also for the export of nitrogen turnover to deeper waters. Now, there are other potential anoxic hotspots and the other why ano anaerobic hotspots uh, uh, in the pelagic apart from, from aggregates. And one thing that's been suspected for a while is copepods. A huge amount of copepods in the oceans. It's, mo it's the most abundant metazoan existing on the planet, grazing on the phytoplankton. And one question we wanted to address is to what extent are copepods internally actually anoxic? That could potentially drive anaerobic metabolisms. And to test that first, it was a little crude here. We had the animals alive, we had them fixed, so they were sitting, filter feeding, and eating. And we could insert a microelectrode into the guts from behind and measure the oxygen profiles through the guts of the amphipods. 
And indeed, they turned out to be anaerobic inside, potentially sustaining anaerobic metabolisms internally. We have now found um, another technique that's a little nicer. We can actually feed, we can do that to all transparent uh, animals actually, they live some filter feeding. We can feed them small beads that have the same chemistry as I showed you on the planar uptrode. And then we can take movies of their guts and thereby take oxygen images inside the guts while the gut is passing through the, uh, through the animals. We, uh, we can also do that for pH and pCO2. And they confirmed the findings, and indeed the guts inside the uh, copepods is anoxic. Um, we also, we, we got, when we sort of tried to look further on to what extent that's sustained denitrification and methanogenesis and so on, we got very different results using living animals. And there could be many reasons for that, different sizes, different physio uh, physiology and different conditions, different life stages. Um, but one thing we tried was to use it with carcasses as well. And actually, most of the zooplankton, or at least a significant fraction of zooplankton caught in the zooplankton net, is in fact carcasses. And when we incubated carcasses, sinking carcasses with uh, N15 uh, nitrate, we could measure the denitrification rates. And that was quite clear. So we had denitrification inside the sinking carcasses uh, that was, and the rate were depending on the availability of oxygen. What are the implications of that? Well, it means, for instance, that if we take the denitrification activity measured in oxygen minimum zones, if you just per cubic meter had six to 150 carcasses, that would have an equivalent amount of denitrification associated to them. If we can extrapolate from these copepods, which is Kalanus finmarkicus here, we don't know that necessarily, we need to go out to check with more species. Um, but, um, we're not saying that all the activity is associated with that, but that's just potential for a significant proportion is associated to sinking carcasses. It also means that the oxygen zones where you get a potential nitrogen uh, or bioavailable nitrate removal into N2 increases by a factor of 50, because suddenly you can have significant proportions of denitrification happening in otherwise oxygen environment. And one back on the envelope case calculation, if you take the Northwest Pacific, where you have oxygen minimums that reach down to 20 micromolar, not an important player in the nitrogen cycle as such. But if you include the number of carcasses that's actually been counted there and say, well, what if scenario, these carcasses respond in the same way as the one we investigated here, then it corresponds to about two millimolar per square meter per day, which is a denitrification that's similar to what you measure in many coastal sediments. Good. So that was a little bit about anoxic micro-niches um, which, which is still kind of controversial and how important they are. But what I want to show here is then the opposite, something about oxic micronutrients in otherwise anoxic world to show some of the approaches you can use for, for investigating that. And that's again the planar uptrode technique. By growing, for instance, Sostera marina, a, a very well-known plant, in front of planar uptrode, we could take images of the oxygen coming out of the roots, which you can sort of see here. These are oxygen concentrations coming out of the roots at different light intensities. These are the light intensities here. And these are the black and white image where you can see the roots. You can see the hotspots of oxygen coming out of the tip of these uh, uh, root zones before it was actually believed that oxygen came out all along the roots. And one had for long looked for coupled denitrification in these systems without finding it. The reason is that oxygen is actually only coming out about around the root tips, which are very dynamic. We can oxygen availability that's coming out of the root is obviously also a function of the availability of the ambient uh, oxygen concentration in the water. And you can see here in this case that when you get down to about 70 micromolar of oxygen in the, amp in the bottom water, oxygen ceases to coming out of the roots. That's when it gets dangerous for the plants. That's where phycotoxins can enter the plant and, and uh, uh, inhibit the plant uh, activity. But these roots grow extremely fast in the order of nine millimeter per day. So you have an oxic micronesis that's moving through the sediment, which never allows the nitrifying community to really develop into doing a significant nitrification rate. And that's why we don't have a stimulated denitrification from the nitrification activities. Another source of oxic micronesis in the sediments are obviously animals. And one early uh, experiment here where we uh, had seen previously some weird things. We had had a bendic transparent chamber which we put out on the seabed, and again and again incubated the same sediment core. 
just to see how con uh, total oxygen uptake rates we got. And during daytime, we got a level here, but just at dusk, we got a tremendous increase in the oxygen uptake rate that declined over the night. And what, when we deployed it along with our periscope here, we got an indication that don't, uh, the dominant uh, fauna here is a polychaete called Hedista divisicolor, was that just at the onset of dusk, you'll see a tremendous stimulated activity of the benthic fauna. They start burying new burrows, they start pumping their burrows, they start to ventilate the whole systems. They are fed uh, or, or predated by fish, so it pays off to be active, fish that hunts by the eyes uh, visually, it pays off to be active at nighttime. And that tremendously stimulates the oxygen uptake rate. So, when you have changes in behavior of the fauna, you can have dramatic changes in the overall oxygen uptake rate. And most people would just do their measurements here and go home and sleep and come back the next day and measure here. So unless you have autonomous in situ instrumentation that can actually map things like that, it would be difficult to see what is actually going on. We have had similar experiments where we can sort of see how, for instance, enhanced turbidity of the bottom waters stimulate the faunal responses and the faunal behavior, and thereby suddenly pumping, releasing much more anaerobic metabolite to the bottom waters and uptake higher uh, of oxygen. Overall, what you can see here is the general perspective that we have the diffusive oxygen uptake rate. This is the fauna respiration and then the irrigation activity. So the irrigation of fauna in the sediments can drastically enhance the oxygen uptake rate of the sediment. Another example of that is just shown here. Uh, that's a fish, lesser sand eel, it's a commercial, very important fish, which tend to bury in sand at, at midnight or during nighttime, but also during winter where they're lying about uh, three months in the sediment. Um, and when I was talking to a, a fish physiologist, he was saying, well, I was asking, well, how do they get oxygen? Well, there's plenty of oxygen in the sediments, he said. That, uh, I, I could show that most likely that's not the case. So what are these fish doing? Well, what you can see if a fish is sitting like that is it's dragging down. We just put some colored water here. You can sort of see they're dragging down the water towards the gills. And here in front of a planar uptroat, you can see the fish is sitting here. They're dragging down water through these permeable pore spaces and have a small halo here of oxygen depleted water coming out. And once in a while, they wriggle and make waves of oxygen that's passing through the sediment. Well, doing that, we could calculate from these images and some incubations that the um, sorry, um, the metabolic costs were much lower by being buried by, for the fish than when it, if, instead of being swimming around and it was avoiding predators and at densities that are quite common in the order of 20 to 50 per uh, square meter, these waves of oxygen that's passing through the sediment have important implications for of course, the microbial communities and the diagenetic processes going on. Here you can sort of see these waves of oxygen passing through. Things that would be very difficult to investigate by other techniques. Good. I think I'll, I'll skip this for now. And then I'll hear... Uh, no, let me take it anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I'll say. If we move from a seascape at an even smaller scale, and we really zoom in on the sediment water interface. Here's some pioneering work of Bo Barger Jørgensen and Dave Dimmery while he was on sabbatical there. Bo Barger is one, my old PhD supervisor, one of my great mentors. Um, you can sort of see the landscape here of the sediment surface, or in this case, a microbial mat, and the diffusive boundary layer covering it. Now, the diffusive boundary layer means that any vertical transport of solutes have to pass by diffusion, and you can calculate roughly the way by how fast things are diffusing through the diffusive bound layer. And the diffusive bound layer is roughly in the order of a millimeter or half a millimeter, and it takes between three seconds to four minutes for oxygen to pass it. Now, if the turnover in sediment is faster than that, it's actually the thickness of the diffusive bound layer that regulates how much oxygen can be consumed and the diagenetic processes in the sediment. And both show that here, where you can sort of see the flux increases with increasing flow velocities oxygen concentrations in increasing at the sediment surface and the oxygen penetration. Okay. This is in a microbial mat is an extreme case, but how important is the diffusive oxygen uptake or the diffusive bound layer actually for regulating the oxygen uptake rate in normal typical sediments? And that's actually a very tricky question to answer experimentally. So instead we did some modeling work and used what I consider to be the best existing diagenetic model developed by Peter Burke at the University of Virginia where we had the extensive database in Oahu's Bay and could feed that into the model and say, well, 
this is the input of organic material. These are the temperatures. This is the oxygen availability. These are all the processes, 27 redox equations. And then predict how the oxygen uptake rate of the seabed would be over a year with or without a diffuser bound layer. So you have the black here, which is the diffuser bound without a diffuser bound layer, as you can see here. And you have the red with um, a diffuser bound layer of 0.1. And what you see here in the summer is what you would expect. You see that the diffusive oxygen uptake rate is vastly higher when you don't have a diffuser bound layer because you don't have that limitation of oxygen diffusing into the sediment. <laughs> However, what you see in the winter is the opposite because here the oxygen uptake rate is actually higher where you have a diffuser bound layer. And the reason is oxygen is used for two things. It's used for aerobic heterotrophic activity or it's used to reoxidize anaerobic metabolites. And what's happening here is you have an oxygen depth that's accumulating that's being repaid in the winter time. So if you integrate over the whole year, the oxygen rate doesn't really change very much, or the oxygen uptake rate changes very much. It changes a little bit for, for reason we can discuss afterwards maybe. But overall, the important thing is it doesn't change very much. What the oxygen diffuser bound layer is doing is it's changing the thickness of the DBL and thereby all the time the oxygen uptake rates and the oxygen availability in the sediment. And this, by using in situ flow measurements, we could quantify the thickness of the diffuser bound layer this is using the true diffuser bound layer. What kind of oxygen uptake rates would you have? You have a tremendous small term variations in the oxygen uptake rate, driven by the fact that the diffuser bound layer is simply just standing, moving up and down. And if you are a microbe sitting in the sediment, what you experience is that the oxygen concentration is constantly changing. So here we have five days. You can have the, the thickness of the diffuser bound layer here. The oxygen concentration in the bottom water is more or less constant. But what you see within the sediment is that the oxygen concentration is varying tremendously. So either you have to be versatile as a microbe to shift between diff different metabolites, or you have to be migrate, you have to move uh, to where uh, conditions are optimal. And maybe that's one of the explanations, not solely. The other thing is the heterogeneous distribution of electron donors, but one of the explanations for why such a big fraction of microbes and sediments are actually more time. Okay, at the end here, I just want to show and uh, demonstrate a new technique that's been introduced to aquatic biology for measuring exchange rate at sediment water interfaces. It's integrated again by Peter Burke, um, um, aquatic eddy covariance. The point with microelectrodes that we've seen is that they only resolve conditions at one specific point, which is nice. We get a lot of detailed information there, but you need many profiles to characterize what's going on. The problem with a chamber is you enclose the thing and you change the light potentially, but you're, more importantly, you change the hydrodynamics. Um, and planar optrodes himself is working on a wall, which is also a problem. The aquatic eddy covariance non-invasively can actually measure the oxygen uptake rate or any other exchange rate across a very big footprint of 100 square meters upstream without affecting it at all. What we're doing is we're measuring the fluctuations in oxygen concentrations, very high frequency, 64 hertz, and we're measuring the vertical flow component of this, the turbulent vertical flow component at the same time. And the idea is a water package that's coming close to the consuming seabed is slightly depleted in oxygen than one coming above. So if we have 64 hertz measure what the concentration is of all of these water packages and quantify where they're all coming from, we can get the oxygen flux. That's the aquatic eddy covariance. It has the advantage, as I say, it can integrate very big areas doesn't change the physical conditions, and we can use it at very complex habitats where it's very difficult to use other techniques to measure the oxygen uptake rates. Like, for instance, coral reefs, or one of the things that I won't have talked to, we've done a lot of work in sea ice using it as measuring of t transport of salts and temperature and oxygen between ice and, and water. It can also work on very long time scales, so it's ideal for observatories, also for quite deep sites, where you can position it and it can measure continuously the oxygen uptake rate without affecting the systems. Uh, and right now I have two postdocs that actually are deploying a system that's going to be three months in the Mediterranean measuring the oxygen uptake rate. That's off the wound delta to study how resuspension events carry on and affect the distribution of exchange of oxygen in, in deeper waters. Uh, but it's a, it's a great tool for measuring exchange rates. If we compare it here at relatively deep site 1500 meters, we can see when you use chambers, eddy covariance, and profiles, this is the site where we saw that characteristic pet size of about two centimeters. So there we should have, they should more or less give each other, give the same average value when we measure profiles enough, and they more or less do 
ground truthing the approach. And you can see the absolute value of 1.5 million per square meter per day, allowing us to target relatively deep waters. This has actually, there's just a paper come out where by optimizing this technique, it can even be driven down to half a millimole per square meter per day. So a technique that also can be applied in the deep sea. Here from some work we did on cold water coral reefs, where we very difficult to measure the oxygen uptake rate on metabolic activities of such communities by, by deploying uh, aquatic aided covariance, we can measure the oxygen uptake rate uh, here. And it was in the order of 20, 25 millimole per square meter per day threefold above the ambient uh, soft bottom communities that are showing how important the cold water coral reefs are as a hotspot for turnover of carbon in, in deeper waters. Here at the very end, I just have a few, I know I'm going lit off the deep sea, but just to show the potential that can be derived from the aquatic aid covariance, that's for some work where we study bending primary production, is work of Carla Tart, a postdoc uh, in my lab too. Um, here, over five days, you have the oxygen and you have the light availability at the seabed, you have the oxygen concentration at the seabed, and then you have the tidal induced variations in the flow velocities. And here you have the oxygen uptake rates. Oxygen release at daytime, oxygen uptake rate at nighttime, nighttime. You can continuously measure the oxygen exchange uh, by such approaches and get really high quality measurements of, for instance, the primary production. Here did an example where he did that seasonally, where you can sort of see that even in the deep winter in the subarctic regions, which is uh, southwest Greenland, this study was conducted, you have in the winter time, it doesn't take very much light to induce a bending primary reduction there uh, going on, and you have a, a community compensation point about 2.3 uh, micromole per uh, square meter per second of, of light, micro Einstein. So just showing that you mix very little light to induce an autotrophic response in these sediments. And actually the bendic primary reduction was significantly more important than the pelagic primary reduction at the range between uh, zero to 50 meters of water depth. If we take the available data we have so far from these aquatic aided covariance from Arctic regions and just plot it versus the daily par, and acknowledging the fact that the highest coastal shelf existing in the world is happening in the Arctic where the ice cover is receding right now, uh, we could quantify how much is the bendic primary production in the Arctic and the potential future Arctic. Using uh, a light relation established by Catuso, how much light availability it takes uh, to induce bendic primary production. And it turns out it's about 23% of the seabed in the Arctic that has a potential for bendic primary production. And using these relations, actually 10 to 30% uh, uh, of the bendic primary production account for what is known to be, or estimated to be today's 10 to 30% pelagic primary reduction, a significant number which may significantly change as sea ice coverage in the region is changing. Good, I wanna conclude by sort of highlighting this point that, that understanding the and interpreting bendic oxygen dynamic truly is a challenge in resolving spatial uh, scales and uh, tem uh, temporal and spatial scales. We have to understand from the scale, the spatial scale of microbial interaction here, in, uh, symbolized by a, 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 a fag in, uh, infecting a cell, onto the hotspots uh, within the sediment, to faunal behavior onto area, and uh, onto the scales of regions of the global area. On the spatial scales, we have to understand eddy kinetics. We have to understand the small scale variation induced by the turbulences in the overlying water. We have to understand how fauna is changing behavior, how seasonals affect, and how colonization and fauna behavior is affecting all uh, 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 diagenetic processes and oxygen exchange rate. And ultimately, we want to understand on geological time scale how much carbon is retained and preserved in the sediment. So that takes a lot of variety of techniques to complement and, and combine to get good questions on that. But having said that, of course, I want to thank the, the funders for much of this work. Uh, and of course, very many co-authoring uh, colleagues on, on these papers, but most importantly, the postdocs and student and technicians uh, that has contributed to this work. Thank you. Questions?
to get what, sorry? The Uh, the denitrification. Okay, what did what we did was we incubated on uh, glass vials moving on a wheel. We had the uh, cohort, and there we added N15 label nitrate to the water, and then we can measure the products of various species of enriched or uh, heavy label nitrate, like for instance, 29 N2 or 30 N2, and from that calculating the denitrification rate. Yes, I mean, this, the response of denitrification is clearly, it's, it's a factor of more things. You can see there's a lot of variation that's because of the size of the animals and what they have been feeding and so on. But most important, it's the octane concentration. So if you have, for instance, COVID pots feeding in the photic zone, sinking through the anoxic zone later on, it could be hot spots for denitrification. That's generally not being accounted for, and that's one of the points. But the other important point is that you can have denitrification occurring in the otherwise oxic water column because you have hotspots of anoxia inside these sinking cobalt pots where denitrification can be occurring. Maybe you said this and I missed it, but what is the explanation or the, the, the mechanism for why there's a greater uh, respiration rate in the deep in the eel uh, sediment versus the crystal? That, that's mainly because we have a higher input of organic material. We don't understand clearly how we also apparently have a higher liability of that organic material. We're currently, because you, for instance, have higher imprints of pigments there than you have in the Bristol plain. And what, one of the things that we're looking into is to how shear and how hydrodynamics in the upper part of the trench can facilitate a faster transport of material to the deeper trench. Yeah, and, but, but still, there's a dynamic in that. So there's, of course, if you are on the abyssal plain, you have an input of carbon that's turned to, and then nothing happens for a while, and then something is coming in again. When you have the trenches, you can have periods where you have a very vast amount of material coming in. For instance, the example I showed you from the Japan Trench, where you had, where clearly had carcasses sliding down along with, the, with this mud slide deep into the trench, and certainly enriching the carbon content of the sediments during that passage there. So it's, it's partly an amount of organic material that's clearly, we can see that from the, uh, from the uh, radionuclide work, that there's clearly a higher deposition, but there's also apparently a higher efficient turnover at these high pressures, which could indicate high liability, or it could be other things. Exactly. Like sinking, yeah. 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 That, yeah. Exactly. And that, that's what we're doing. That's something we don't understand. That we don't understand about it. There are very, very few measurements of deep hydrodynamics. We don't have uh, flow meters. There are very few ones sitting at, at significant depth. But what you can see, you can even see the tidal imprint. When you sit and watch on the videos in the deep sea, you can see the tidal imprint at 10 kilometers of water depth, which clearly show a connectivity. But I also think that the, the trenches act uh, more like a, a funnel also. But uh, do you see like uh, really increases in OBS, optical backscattering, or stability also as you go into the trench? Because I would, in the remote fracture zone, we did see, and this is also a really steep uh, canyon in the middle yeah. of the ridge of the equator. And there we did see some signatures of recent tension yeah. At uh, 4,000 meters, 7,000 meters, mm. but at 4,000 meters already, so we, we did see like clouds. Yeah. Off and we have, uh, we have observed similar. And clearly, the four months after the big earthquake, you had still had a water column of 50 meters completely turbid. I mean, that's, so that's things that are 
slowly still resuspending down along the slopes and an unstable, unstable, what you call that, angle of, of the side of the trench. The eddy only applies as a, gives us a total measure. Then you need other techniques to go in and say, well, what is the distribution? And we'd of course do that with imaging and so on. See, well, who is there and how many are there to try to quantify that. But the eddy only gives you an overall abundance. The footprint covers 100 meters, but it goes around all the time. Yeah, it's an ellipsoid about 100 meters and it's one meter wide. It, you can model the exact footprint size on given conditions but it moves around. And one thing that you can do is you can relate the oxygen fluxes to the angle where the footprint is moving with the tide and then see if you have areas where you suddenly have a much higher imprint and you could go up and look there upstreams and see, well, what communities are there compared to over here, for instance. So that way you can compare communities on that scale at least. I, um, it would probably be possible, but I don't think it's worth it. I mean, what, what we need this for, I, it, it's an important thing when one address a question and answer a question that you know what kind of measurements it is you're doing. And very often you see oxygen uptake rates of sediments just being used as oxygen uptake rate of sediments. It's not, it's a lot of other things. So one just has to be careful defining the question and then use the technique that's most appropriate to address exactly that question. Of course, it's great to complement in, and, and, and uh, for instance, the eddy covariance, I think, is going to be a technique that's really going to change many things. Um, planner uptrodes and so on, I think, are so s sophisticated to work with if you just, just want to use it as a basic tool. But it can provide some basic information and understanding of the dynamic and what is happening. Like, for instance, this homing and the distribution uh, of, of uh, myofauna and microorganisms in the seabed. It depends on how you express your heterogeneity, because clearly the, the extent that you change the oxygen uptake rate depends on the, uh, the communities that you're affecting. So that means if you have a hotspot of one community and another hotspot here, they may respond differently to a pressure release, a pressure change, a temperature change. So what you measure out there might be uh, skewed by the fact that you have variability. I'm sure you will still measure heterogeneity at the surface, but it might be a different, it might be even a different scale than what you would experience in situ. Because we cannot simply predict, there was a nice relation you can show with depth, you can just say, well, if that's the relation between the ratio between in situ and lab versus water depth, you just multiply by that factor. And I have seen papers doing that, but I don't really believe that that's the way forward. So, so I would be very uh, careful interpreting things done shipboard when we talk about metabolic activities at least from sediments. I would probably get about the same variability rates at the surface. You, you probably, probably would, would. I, I, but I would doubt that the, uh, that the slope would be the same. You would get the same variability probably, I don't know. But this, the steepness of the slope would not be the same. Because you would in, tend to intensify activity in the deeper compared to what it is in lab. Uh, any other questions? Are you planning to use the 
it's it, it's a thing we're playing around with here. Yeah. We can't resist it, <laughs> trying it at least. <laughs> so, so we might go for it. I mean, the commercial available system that goes because you need an ADV, and the commercial available system that exists doesn't go that deep now. So we'd have to talk with the company to build a special housing for it. But it's uh, it's tempting to try some of it, and it can be used down to four thousand meters now. It has been realized down to four thousand meters. this morning, how many of them will translate into Havel, um, Havel work? So would you do the planar octodes work um, in the trenches, for example? It depends what we find in the Atacama trench. trench. We can do it. It's just a matter of if it's worth. We need to have a good question. Right. And, and uh, in most of the trenches we've been so far, except for the Japan trench, where we only have this one visit because of that tsunami, we'd like to go back, where you have oxygen penetration of about six centimeters in the Atacama Trench. Very exciting to see what shallow oxygen penetration we have there. There it would be valuable potentially to deploy the planar upload system to sort of see the dynamic and to sort of see um, activities around the oxygen zone. I, I should say one thing we have done already in the deep sea is we have taken advantage of an observatory of Japan, which is used for monitoring earthquakes. Uh, where we, they had extra capacity and you could sit and land and see the data coming in. We mounted our planner uptrode to that observatory and over three months monitored the oxygen distribution at the primary interface. And we could see how all the foraminifera and all the myofauna moved around this oxy anoxy uh, zone that you had on the surface and see how long time they stayed in the anoxic uh, environment. But we could also see a tremendous variability in the oxygen penetration depth, even at about two kilometers of water depth of Japan. be important to be able to make measurements say every two centimeters or, or, or so, right? How, how far can that lander travel on the seafloor? It's, it's, a, it's a bit cheating. The lander as such is not uh, moving. It has a sledge inside where we can move the instruments around them. So it's constrained by the frames that, that we have so far. Well, there, there are very many effects, uh, derived effects. The, set, the biotubation, depending on if it's, well, right now there's a lot of dynamic how you define biotubation. But if we here define biotubations as particle mixing, they are obviously are very important for homogenizing or distributing. In one way, homogenizing the distribution of organic material, but they also defecate, so they also concentrate it in other areas. And that can be very important for the patchiness of the microbial community. Overall, of course, they're very important for the metal cycling. They're very important for the iron oxide, iron sulfide dynamics. They're very important for the manganese cycling, manganese respiration. So overall, the redistribution of particles is very important. Uh, for, for the important for the nitrogen cycling, it's mainly the transport of water in their burrows and their systems around. And you can see that they can grossly inject nitrate into great depth into the sediments. And we also have a lot of in situ measurements using nitrate microprofiles. I only showed oxygen profiles. We also have nitrate microprofiles where you can sort of see activities of fauna cle clearly enriching the nitrate concentration deep within the sediment, clearly stimulated with the, um, the denitrification rate. At the same time, they also transport oxygen very deep so they can locally, to the extent that conditions are stable, support a nitrification community, or nitrifier community, which can do uh, nitrification. And for instance, it's been shown in some systems you have almost 100% of the denitrification is coupled to nitrification because of very efficient pumping and pumping patterns of fauna. So it has a many derived effects on, on the nitrogen cycling. So it's most important in the depth of Well, it's the extent they, they dig down and can do it, but you have fauna that can that goes meters into the sediment. Uh, but, but, uh, Typically, yes. I mean, you have a mixing of the upper. That's also what the radionuclides show. You can see the lead 210 is sort of more or less evenly distributed, which defines the biotubation zone, which is in the order of 5, 10, 20 centimeters. Yeah. And then you have extreme cases where it can go deeper. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>